One realizes very quickly we've been seeing this technology for decades. I had access to, to all those programs. Surfaces, no obvious signs of propulsion, and yet this object is witnessed now by four separate individuals in two separate aircraft. Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to the channel. Good to see a lot of people here in the live chat, as always. Um, if you guys have any questions, as always, put them in capital letters, keep the chat nice and polite. Even if we have differences of opinions, we don't need to be horrible. Um, yeah, I think one thing I'd like to mention before we bring on my guest today is uh, I'm sure you're all aware of Andy McGrillan and that UFO podcast. Well, uh, he's a part of UAP Media UK, along with myself and a few other good folk. And we are about to launch our annual fundraiser raffle which we do each year at this time. Um, and Andy has already released the first kind of um, way of supporting it, and that is Sean Cahill's track Goblin Problems, which is used at the end of each show on that UFO podcast. You can now own the entire track. Um, the link is in the description. You can go in. I think it's a £3 minimum. You can pay what you want after that if you want to donate more. And it all goes to Cash for Kids charity. So we're going to announce the big, uh, the full fundraiser in the next few days and there's some incredible prizes up for grabs so look out on my social media is that ufo podcast uap media uk uh, and you'll see how you can kind of take part and support two good charities so with that out of the way guys thank you for being here um my guest tonight is paul sinclair i met paul back in june in blackpool at, uh, the awakening conference and i said paul i need to interview you on the show and it's took till the end of November, but we're here today, and it's going to be a really fascinating conversation. So please welcome Paul Sinclair. Thank you, Vinny. Great to be here, and uh, we'll just share a few bits of information with you, yourself and your guests. And no, I really stuff. appreciate it. Really do appreciate having you on. Um, now, I think the best place to start would just be your background, you know, and what kind of got you into the whole UFO, paranormal, cryptid, the whole sort of uh, mysterious subject, if you don't mind. Yeah, not a problem. Cryptids, no idea how I got into it. Well, I, I have. It were right in first book. There weren't an interest there till probably 2015. Uh, none at all. Uh, not so I've looked into UFOs, always had an interest due to my own experiences in childhood. And uh, I don't even think I don't even think you know you've got an interest. It's it's just there. It just it just comes with you from childhood, kind of through, and all that all that stopped probably at the age of about I don't know seventeen, eighteen, and then for some reason, no idea why. And and then as soon as I moved to Bridlington in nineteen ninety three, stroke four, I can never get it quite right. It it, 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 it it literally started again. And I don't mean it started again that year or two years after. It literally started within days of mo buying this property, uh, which was strange. It kind of th The people who think, I wonder if your life's mapped out. I'm not one of a subscriber to that, but it does make you wonder. You know, yeah. it, it did start again. So, yeah, UFOs. I, mean, I don't know how old I would be, probably five or six years old. Lived in a little council house in... A place called Old Denaby, a village, and it overlooked Mexborough, the town. Yep. <clears throat> and you've got the Mexborough power station to the right hand side. You've got two great big cooling towers, and you've got this pasture with cattle in it, and reeds and swamp land, and about a mile looking to Mexborough, all street lights. For some reason, on this particular night, that I'm in, I'm in this back bedroom, my dad came and woke me up. Really unusual. He got me up and he, he showed me this. He didn't say this is a UFO. He wanted to show me this sphere of light turning. It looked like it were it were it were just turning within itself. It were a lemony lemony white colour, and it were lower than power station cooling towers, about halfway up them, but at side of them. And from that, 
it travelled and they'd got some really good binoculars. I still got them. I mean, by today's standards, they're not good, but then they were. And uh, this thing just travelled along rooftops, some extra above them, obviously, but and yeah. disappeared up towards Swinton. We've since found out now, thanks to a good friend who lives in the area, there's a newspaper report, 1966, so that's when it was, and I was born in 62. So don't ask me a year. I'm going to have to get down. I only found out this year and get this. It, it, it was a guy who saw the who, who claimed to have took the photographs of the UFOs at Conisborough. I don't know if you've ever seen that picture. Probably. It, it, it's, it's out there on net. It's a famous picture. A lot of people say it's fake. I don't know. I didn't know the guy till he started corresponding with me and is that the one with like three objects or that's something? The one. Yeah, yeah 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 and uh, he, he just got in touch and it turned out that's the that's the guy who took him and uh stephen pratt i think they called him and uh yeah there we go so that's 1966 so we're assuming that's the same one because it was described as being seen outside at cooling towers at Metro power mm. station i don't know from there there's just been odd sightings throughout years and then when we got to bridlington up on the walls, East Yorkshire walls, farmers and different people were getting in touch. I think as soon as you start voicing an opinion or showing that you've got an interest in this subject, I don't mean people just come out of the woodwork, but like-minded people do seem to attract and, and you, you, it's like a magnet. They, they're drawn to you or you're drawn to them and, and that's basically how it works. I think we're all doing it. That's probably why there'll be people wanting to look for, for this podcast at some point, you know, not because of Paul, just because of the UFO phenomena, the cryptids, whatever. So, yeah, yeah I mean, it's nonstop. We had a brilliant sighting at, in 2000. I think it was 2002. Uh, at a place called Sledmere, be about 12, 15 miles away from where I'm sat now, traveling home from York. Uh, I think it was. I think it was June, and I'd got this. We were in a van. I was with another joiner called Shorty, uh, and I always say, to, as though I'm some kind of comedian, but I'm Shorty, and to this guy was six foot five, it's Chris Short. <laughs> so I don't know. We're driving up to Mist, and it's a little village, and it had a fire station, just one fire engine in it. But the reason we stopped there, that's where we stopped, because as we're driving up this hill to, to back home to Bridlington, above trees, there's a huge tube. I call it. I likened it to a breadstick. That's the kind right. of shape of it. And it were, it was literally above the trees. So I stopped the van and we got out. We're looking at this thing. And I'm saying to Shorty, because he's not a very interesting subject at all, you know, saying so you can't say at work tomorrow that we, you've not seen this. You, you, and is it one of them UFO? I can hear him saying it. Is it one of them UFO thingies? And you could <laughs> feel it. So it's, Vinny, you could feel this thing. Oh, wow. Feel it. it was my pulsing. It was strange. We looked at each other. And said, where's it gone? It didn't fly away. It had just gone. I went to Bridlington Free Press and said what we'd seen. And the following week, another couple, or a, a couple got in touch. They'd seen it as well, which were interesting. So that was, that, that, I don't know what, what year. Someone tells me it was 2002. 2014, just over the brow, of, as you come over Sledmere, you go to a place called Cotton. All these are up on Wolds. Uh, the walls is like an ancient term for the wilds. It's just it's just barren land, no good for anything really. By grazing sheep and you know, and there's not many trees there because it's just it's a bit wild. And, yeah. you know, and so I got going to a few farms in area, get get to know them. And up, up at Cotton, there's this particular farm there, and I got a phone call to say that they'd seen a UFO. They'd seen this strange object. This was this was 2014, I think. And there's some great big gates, big enough for combines to go in and everything. I used to park there. They got to know me because I looked suspicious. Park there <laughs> at night. You know, well, it's true. And, and they came up. The two farmers, literally. Our uh, guy called Steve Ashbridge. And uh, what are you doing? And when, as soon as we told them, the, it, it, everything softened. They'd seen these things. They'd seen these strange lights. But they're, after all, they're in the middle of nowhere, these farms. So in in end, we... I don't mean we became great friends, but he'd say to, we were friends. He'd said to me, yeah. like, when you come up, don't park on the road. Just pull off onto the farm, make sure the gate's shut when you've gone. So on the road, he told me he'd seen this object. And I went up to speak to him. And these great big gates. He says, my son and my wife, he said, we've just come home. Summertime, uh, sorry, uh, late evening, summertime, but not quite dark. And 
they've just had a master put up at the bottom. Their their cottage or their farmhouse, should I say, doesn't even you can't even see it from road. It sort of goes down into a little valley. And in the valley, they'd had a, a mast put up to measure wind speed. Tall, thin mast. He says, and son gets out at car to shut the gate. And then, I'm not sure which one saw it. I think it was son show it and said, Dad, look, look. And coming up below the, the brow of this, this sort of all old out area, this valley, is like a huge, similar, it sounds like what we saw. And it's literally a, probably a mile away white he described it as a jumbo jet without wings on its side just coming up he said it was in front of the mast so that you and it's coming up towards and they could see wind. there was three people two of them could see windows in it the the, the farmer he couldn't they all did me drawings for it just little rough sketches and it's coming towards them just slowly coming towards them and the panicking and then all of a sudden they said where's he gone and it had just vanished so I wonder if we were dealing with the same thing. There's there's ten or twelve years in between, you know. But it, yeah. it's interesting. And and up around the East Yorkshire Wolds and North Yorkshire, these things have been seen for years. There's a farmer up there, and I I believe he's probably got more f UFO footage than certainly anybody in the United Kingdom. He's got wow. he's got cameras on cams. In every window, every upstairs window, just sweeping day and night and collecting this information. And do you know who knows about it? Obviously, I know, and I'm talking about it. I'm not going to say who he is, but nobody really. He's, he's just he's just obsessed. He's, you know, he's watching all the time. I will say that he's he's with he's in he's within eye shot of RF Staxton Wold. Right. Uh, literally, very close to RF Staxton Wold seen lots of unusual things bearing in mind there's no landing strip at rf Staxton wall it's not it's, you can't land aircraft there or anything like that and they've seen lots of aerial phenomena we, and we have as well up around there i mean some some unusual things many i don't know what you'd even term them as i mean it could be earth earth related phenomena you know right. earth lights even because i was up there once again, I can't remember the date, but we're probably 2015 with Steve Ashbridge at back of Staxton Wall, the radar base, and a guy called Joe Dormer, who would run the UFO Society, Yorkshire UFO Society. He didn't drive, and we went and picked him up at Scarborough, and he came through with us. And I'd got a Sony VX2100 camcorder, big digital thing, you know, and uh, I'm stood there with this camcorder, and we're looking around. In the distance, we can see the village of Driffield, and... I suddenly became animated because from the ground, covering a monstrous area, this huge mushroom-shaped turquoise light just went, just snapped into existence. Didn't light the sky up, it just... And I'm telling Steve, I'm telling Joe, instead of putting my camera on. It had gone, it was there. In an instant, it's gone. So I'm not, I should have put my camera on and just filmed the area. I'm trying to tell them, I'm trying to bet, I'm trying to sort of... I'm wanting them to believe me because I've no proof of it other than what I'm saying. You know, and I'm trying to describe what it was. I said it almost had like tentacles in it. It was really strange, it, like a like a jellyfish that are just right. from the ground. Anyway, as we're talking about it, it did it again. So then to saw it. Me and Steve were convinced it were going to be in local papers the next day. It covered such a large area. It, I mean, we talk. We were looking at it from. Our perspective up at Staxton Wall down towards Driffield, it looked like it covered like a mile area. It was huge. Nothing. Wow. Nobody said a word. I'm not saying that were UFO related, but it's unusual phenomena, even if it's natural phenomena. I've never seen anything like it. And once again, in that zone. So, so me and Steve, we probably stayed up on the walls intermittently you know probably three or four times a week we'd go up there and observe because our working mm. time as well all the time and steve is well still is and uh we'd go up three or four times a week and get to all these unusual places places where unusual things were happening like langtoft and cottam and sledmere and it really is renowned for it if you'd have gone if you look at old ufo reports on net and you do a bit of digging around yorkshire you'll see these locations come up and they come up in folklore as well for or, just, just very close to it, there's a valley called the Beesendale Valley, and they talk about the phantom lights at the, in the Beesendale Valley. But they're all obscure things that you'd have to find in local archives that, that, that have never kind of hit the internet. Do you know what I mean? I yeah, know, yeah. 
yeah, I wrote about this stuff in Truth Proof 1 and Truth Proof 2, the first two books. And then I kind of moved away, not from the walls. I think it's like all these areas. The activity started to decrease. And then we found out that there were a lot of activity being seen along the coastline of eastern North Yorkshire. So we, we moved. Do you know what I mean? We sort of fell out with walls then for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, we... It's, it's just the way it goes. And then, like you said, we moved on to, on to the eastern North Yorkshire coastline, which is all literally 500 yards from where I'm sat now. You know, yeah. you know the front. And there's not stuff seen every day. Myself and Bob Brown and Steve occasionally, we, we can go up four or five times a week. We were up there last night. So what we've, I've called the ILFs, the Intelligent Life Forms, about two weeks ago. So two. I, I went up specifically because the day before, someone was at a place called Hunmanby, six miles down the coast and he rang me up he said where are you Paul I said well I'm at home he said well I'm I'm on cliff tops with my wife they're sat in a car I think he says and the seven spheres of light out at sea in a line wow. orange, orange spheres of light he says he said they've just gone off and now they're on on top of cliffs when I say on top above the cliffs but you know they look like they're sort of not far very far above the cliff tops of Bempton and Speet and this were early this were early evening it were dark it was strange because me, myself and Bob had said we were going to go up there 11 till 1. Normally, we'd have gone up earlier, but we realised we're not getting a lot of success. But as you know, and as everyone else knows, unexplained phenomena does not present to order. You know, it's yeah. when you least expect it. And and if, if as I believe, and maybe other people believe, there's, there's, there is awareness to, to a lot of what we're looking at, you're not going to see it anyway. I go out there with a bag of tricks and the, and a lot of people say, well, you're not going to get these things because you've, you're taking your cameras with you. True. Uh, you know, it's, it's possibly true. It's not going to stop me because yeah. otherwise all I'm doing is sat here looking at this computer screen, doing what I'm doing now. I want to present some proof to somebody. You know, I, I, I if I listen to somebody's account, I'm hoping to see a little bit more than just that. Yeah. That's, that's why first-hand accounts are always preferable. I don't really bother with you know, second-hand accounts at all, really. But, yeah, so we're up there all the time. And it's basically, it's not happening. But it's 24 hours in a day, you know, and there's a, there's yeah. a lot of hours that you're not there. So, yeah, that's just brief sort of outline of the activity. No, that's fantastic. And you mentioned the earth lights or that, that kind of type of phenomena. That is something I'm actually personally invested in. I was out in Colombia this year looking at something along those lines, strange orbs. Um, and then I've been researching things like the Longdendale lights seen just off the Snake Pass near Manchester. And yeah, but you mentioned the, the coastline where you are. I spend a lot of time up at Flamborough and Cleethorpes. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Um, probably four or five times in the last eighteen months. And there is something about that area. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but it, I'm always, I always, when it goes dark, I'm out on the edge of the cliffs at Flamborough, just looking out over the sea. So, what do you think it is about that sort of coastline? I don't know. I mean, I've gone back. Excuse me, I've gone back into Coast Guard logs and lifeboat logs. I don't mean every year. I've not been privy mm. to every year and every Coast Guard station, but the, the, what do I think it is about the coastline? What is it about any place? Is it just because they've got somebody who's investing time in it that these things are being seen and they could be being seen in all parts of, of the United Kingdom? You know, if, if, if you were willing to spend that time, you know, I packed in work as in I'd worked really hard for a living and I packed in doing joinery when I was 48. Uh, so I've, and I've, I look at this like a full time job, even though it pays absolutely zilch. But yeah. but, but I, I invest invested so much time in it that, that that's what it's like. It's, it, I was up at five this morning, and you, you know if something was seen and it, it, it required me to go out at half four in the morning, five in the morning, I would go. What is it about the coastline? I, I, I really don't know. But location is key to these things. I, you know, I'm not, I, that's not a contradiction when I've just said it could be being seen all around the UK. Because I do believe certain areas are a lot more prolific for unexplained phenomena. And I seriously believe, not just because I live here, seriously believe that Bempton and Speeton are primary locations, probably Speeton more than Bempton, because it's so unpopulated. Mm. And it's, it's a beach that's, fair, you, you know, because you'll have been there, it's fairly hard to access. You can only get to it from the Speeton Church and it's a you're dropping down into a ravine which is 400 foot It's and it's really steep. I mean, locals call it Killer Hill. Not because <laughs> it's a killer there, it's, it's just because it's, it's a killer to get back up. 
<laughs> so, so what I'm saying is, for the for the lack of footfall, it's receiving lots and lots of reports of unexplained phenomena, and there's no footfall hardly. So you, you realise that this place is is a, a special place when it comes to sightings of, of UFOs and sightings of lights beneath the surface of the sea. And I mean, uh, I'm not going to detail about uh, Ben Walgate's report because it's Ben. Somebody spoke to Ben at Flamborough. I hope I can get to speak to him and told him about an 8 a.m. early morning sighting on a bright sunny day of an object leaving the sea near the lighthouse at Flamborough. Myself wow. and yeah, myself and Jason Davis, who has done the artwork on uh, Night People, uh, we saw multiple spheres of light over the sea off Flamborough Head when Jason came up for a few days. We filmed them with psionics cameras. Unfortunately, I, I, I'd have preferred my Sony's 4K camera, to be honest, but they, they don't cope with lights as well as a psionics, but a psionics does not give you a proper representation of the colour. You know, it's right. brilliant. you can see in the dark where they can't, but it doesn't give you a proper representation of the colour, and these were bright orange. With the psionics, they've come out white. But, you know, we've got them. I mean, I'm not really showing footage. We've put some in for Wolflands, actually. So, oh, yeah. Well, yeah. But I found a couple of photographs on Facebook of yours, and if you don't mind, I'd like to sh just ask you about these and show them. Well, on the I screen. can't see them actually, but so if I bring them up on the screen, I'll, I'll no, bring them no. up. If, let's have a look because these really stood out, and I didn't know if they had a prosaic explanation or yeah, not. Well, they're, no, they were filmed uh, with, with Jason Davis. Uh, now, these these are frame captures, are they? Yes. There's, yeah. Well. There's the, uh, the, the, I can assure you, if anybody gets to watch Wolflands, you'll see these things just appearing and disappearing. They're not they're not flying; they're just literally just switching on, and that's that's the way these things operate. Uh, we took a I took a old rock angler up onto cliff tops, oh, about two years ago, called Mick Sigson, and he's keen to tell. He's a great guy, but he's keen to tell you he's fished these cliffs, man and boy, fifty years. <laughs> you know, he's his seventies, Mick. And he dropped on us this particular night. I'll, if you want, I'll just tell you briefly. Myself yeah, please. At, well, we're on the cliff tops. Pitch black night. There's no buildings anywhere. It's devoid of everything. And there's a the lone rock angler about a mile down the coast. We can see his headlight, his torch. And these guys literally, I've said it many times, they literally climb over the fence, stand on the edge of these cliffs, three to 400 foot, cast out and the fishing. So... He starts walking towards us after half an hour, three quarters of an hour. I said to Bob, when he comes, gets a bit closer, I'm going to put a light on. I don't want to startle him. And that's what I did. So he stops. He's got his rod and his bag and he's having a, a natter to us. And he knew who I was, even though I didn't know him. And uh, because he knew that this guy coming up here, speaking to rock anglers and speaking to people around there, see, trying to gather information. Yeah. And I asked him if he'd seen these spheres of light. What you're on about, that's the psionics image. That So they, they're bright orange, what you can see in that picture. Oh, right, okay. They're, they're a, a vivid orange, but that's, that's the letdown of, of that camera, you know? Yeah, they're, they're bright orange. And the lights that you can see on the horizon are fishing boats, so you can see. And from that altitude, you've probably got 18 miles, because that's at Lighthouse, them cliffs aren't as high. So you're looking at 18 miles to the horizon. Right. They're fishing boats on horizon that you can see in bottom. So, what am I saying here? So, yeah, this Mick Sigson, uh, he said he'd never seen these lights. And he fished there all these years. He said, but I have seen a spaceship. I said, really? And there's a hill at the back of us where we were stood. So it landed on that hill in 1998, November, in a club match, he said. Because all fishing matches, the Filey Fishing Club and the various ones, they like to fish these cliff tops. So he went on to explain... I already knew the story, but I had a second-hand account, so I'd never written about it. And I knew the son of one of the anglers who were there that night, and he told me that his dad saw this spaceship land. He didn't say on that hill, because he's just relating it to me, mm. away from that setting. And they were all frightened, and some of them left the fishing tackle and did a runner. So he's telling me about this thing. He said, I turned round, he said, and my first impression was, what's a, what's a combine harvester doing up on hill at that this time of year? Then I realised I could see between the hill and the, the object, I can see sky. So he said, with this, he said, it starts to descend. And it's just a big blob of yellowy orange light, all lights flashing all over on it, he said. Silent. And with this hill is about 
150 yards away from where we were stood. Well, that's basically where we are, we are all the time. Yeah. Uh, if, when we, me and Bob go up there, he said, and then as it started to land, all sparks started to come off it around it. And when it landed, it, a ring of flames came around it. He said, and that was it, we left. We, we weren't staying no no more. But what I'm, what I'm getting at here, so I'm just sort of rambling on a little bit here, Vinny, sorry it's about right. that. No, I, no, it's good. I asked him about the orange lights, and I've got Bob Brown stood with me. And as we stood there talking, two orange lights appear above us. <laughs> Seriously, I've got the camcorder out, Sony NX80, half decent, switched off. Stand there. We we waiting for it to happen again. It didn't happen. Put the cam, camera away. They come back on <laughs> again, and, and it really happened like that. Walking down the cliffs, that back back to the car park. That's how it was happening. I took a guy up there called Lee Haywood. Lee's sort of familiar with everything that's in sky boats out on sea. Could have told you the lot. He's a real switched on guy. It, it, <laughs> I don't want to put it, yeah, that's, that's his name. So anybody that wants to look for Lee, ask him about it. You'll find him on social media. Real, really articulate, switched on guy. He came to give me an explanation to what I was seeing, a, an earth-based e explanation. And I didn't mind because Lee's, you don't come at it with a, you're talking a load of rubbish, Paul. You know, no. and I'll tell you what it is. He comes at, he's, a, he's just a decent bloke. We're driving down Cliff Lane to the cliff tops. Ask me what the lights looked like. And it sounds like a cliche, something like that. And there's one there. <laughs> Over the course, course of that night, when we got set up, I set a camera up, these lights presented five or six times at different intervals. You can't, you, when you try to film them, it, you, you, well, it's, it's virtually impossible. We got them with the psionics that night. Uh, Chris Turner came up with me and Jerry Denning. You'll know Jerry. They're both good cameramen. Right, yeah. So, so you you know, anybody in chat, ask them if they managed to film them. I managed to film them, and I got some footage of them. I think I got I think I got about three five to ten second segments. But by the time you, you you're looking and you can't quite believe what you're looking at, and you're putting your camera on, they've gone. Jerry yeah. couldn't get them. Chris didn't get them. Jerry's Jerry was interesting because he he was measuring the light in is it Calvin's uh, and and. He said it were a really unusual light. He, he was, he'd be better qualified to speak about this light than me. Right. Uh, and and, he, and I think he is qualified to speak about it as well. So, um, yeah, interesting that, as I say, we took Mick Sigson and these things were turning off. So I don't know what they are. Intelligent light forms is what I called them, ILFs. Yeah, they're fascinating. And you mentioned that you've got some footage coming up in your new documentary, Wolfland. So let's talk about the documentary, um, what it's kind of about, the gist of it, and and then we can go into kind of the, the process of actually putting it together, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, it, it, it evolved more than put together. I'm, I'm doing the documentary 50-50 with Les Drake. It's all my research and all my work. Sorry for putting it like that, people, but it is. But Les is the guy that's editing it. Les has he's, he's worked tirelessly. Wolf fans, we've been doing it three years. It's right. a it's a new thing for Les because Les had filmed, you not mind me saying, weddings and things like that before. But he'd had an interest in unexplained phenomena, so we became friends. And I said, look, I'd, I'd like to do this documentary. I'd like to do something with this, and it just grew. It just evolved, and I, I'd already got some incredible witness accounts. So we've just we've travelled from Flixton in the film, in the documentary. It's an hour and 27 minutes at the moment, and there's a, it'll, that's what it'll about finish at. So it's not, sort of, you know, something like a 30-minute job. There's a, tons of work gone into it. And we started in Flixton because that's where the first stories of the Flixton werewolf came to me back in 2014, 2015, writing the first book. That's the cover of the first truth group book behind me. And, uh, you know, I was getting reports of, People just claiming to see a fur-covered bipedal animal in and around the area of Flixton and Caton. And it's impossible, Vinny. And I think a lot of your listeners and people realise that, it's, that it, I don't think we've got the landmass to support anything like that or hide it, not around Flixton. Mm. You, know, we, you know, we talk about Flixton Wold and Staxton Wold and the woodland, but it's not massive. The forests of North Yorkshire, are, we've got 525 square miles of forest and moor, and a lot of it's untrod. 
But I still don't believe that we've got something that's permanently living and breathing in those areas. I just can't get my head around how it could be. But we've got these reports from independent people unconnected to one another describing seeing something akin to what we would describe as a werewolf or if you want to call it a dog man i think it can't seem splitting or somebody wants to call it a dog man and it's almost as though we can't call it that who cares it's it's a fur covered bipedal creature regardless of what you want to call it and i do believe that these people have seen this what they claim to have seen you know we go back to the reign of Athelstan, 937 AD, 1,084 years ago. And you've got the king then having the refuge built at Flixton to, for, for, for the protection of travellers from wolves. So we know that wolves would have been prevalent, don't we? we that yeah. was without yeah. saying. But he come, there's that other line tagged onto it and an infestation of savage beasts. So I don't know. Is it a play on words? Is Paul trying to say, oh, that's what they were? I don't know. But mm. we, it's, the, the writing is there. And then throughout that time, I've got reports from the 50s, not 1,084 years ago. For, sorry, from the 1940s, the 1950s, 60s, 70s, right up to present day. And the, they're not doing it for kicks. Most A lot of the reports will never get to a documentary like Wolfland's. They might get in a book with a name change because people – are, af are afraid of the stigma that's attached to saying they've seen something like this. You know, a, there's a forest not far from uh, Flixton, and, and it's got a, there's a water course, the River Derwent. Everything seems to follow the Derwent, which is interesting. But there's a forest up there called Broxer Forest. There's three men from Rotherham who loved wild camping, and they'd basically jim would pick an area he was he was sort of the the leader great guy and uh they'd go somewhere remote take a few beers maybe a lot enough food for what they wanted and they'd just set up camp and they'd do it a couple of times a year and they chose broxer and uh, we've got two of them gone on film they've spent nights in forest with us since uh, in 2018 that they claim to have seen this thing but the, the witness who won't go on film and that's fair he knew it were there before they saw it. They mm -hmm. said that it's an 800 foot ravine into the bottom of the ravine and you've got the River Derwent and they set camp up. They've not been, they're not looking for unexplained phenomena. They're not looking for anything weird. They're there to just have a, a weekend in uh, wild. This is an old, old woodland, old forest. And he's saying, we've got to go. I don't like it, we're being watched. Something's watching us. And they're looking at him and they can't work it out because it's just out of character. Mm. it's getting dark and this ravine you come down on your backside in places i mean we've been in it we've spent nights in it and uh it's i don't like it i don't like it and then this went on and on and on and then jim said and steve they said we've been sat there for a while and suddenly a huge pair of amber eyes lit up in darkness no light on self-illuminating out where's this bioluminescence come from that's nothing normal to animal kingdom we know that mm. the marine life have it but what i'm saying is not not some living breathing mammal that have to torch sticking on it and highlighting eyes so he said all the time he's getting he's frightened now and they're trying to contain him they think he's going to run off into the darkness he said and in the end i stood up and i made a few took a few steps towards it he says i didn't know what it was they were about three foot off ground but they were huge eyes he likened them to the size of a cow's eyes apart. And right. He said, mm, made a few hissing sounds, and it disappeared. So I turned around, and when I looked at, we'll call him Witness C, or B, whatever you want, and, and Steve, he said, they've just literally, jaws have dropped. So when I turned back, and that, these are his words, I can, we've, we've been so entrenched in Wolfland, he said, I, went, I just went, oh, my God. He said, I've never felt fear like that before. He said, from being three foot in ground, off, in, off ground, these eyes are now seven foot in air and they can see this thing. Now, right. I, find, I find that incredible. It watched them all night. It stood watching them all night. Terrifying. I didn't advance towards them. It, it, it turned to one side a few times. They could see a muzzle. Steve said, if you'd have asked me to draw a werewolf, I would not have drawn that. He said, it looked ridiculous. <laughs> he said, its ears were so big 
pointed and stuck up. The muzzle was so long. He said, but it was just built incredible. He, he said, you couldn't have fit two men into its size. So then we've got seven miles away in a neighbouring forest because everything's linked, just, but it's just altered by name. Yeah. With Cropton and Stape. And there's a gamekeeper who sees something very similar in 2002. And he's, 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 he's using an abandoned farmhouse as his, uh, as his base camp. He, and he said, he, like his exact words, he said, I've gone a bit feral. You know, <laughs> the farmhouse had been abandoned since 1956, I think. And he came across it and he's laid in a sleeping bag one night. He says, doors bolted up, other doors barricaded up, because it don't, doesn't bolt or lock. Yeah. Fire's dead. There's only glowing embers. He said, and I looked up and this thing just comes to the window and it's looking in at me. And seven miles away. Say, but, but if we if we remove the names, it's just all one area. Yeah. You, yeah. Know? you know, you'll have a bit of moorland in between and rivers and streams. And uh, but what's interesting, Vinny, the night or the a few nights before, I'm not gonna say the night because I don't think we're all a bit loose on the, uh, the exact time frame before. But he's walking back to the farmhouse with his cousin who'd come to stay with him for a few days. His cousin went the following day. And as they're walking along one of these logging roads between 10 and 11 at night, a sphere of light just sprung up from the ground at the side of them. It's about baseball size. He says, I immediately dropped my cousin to the floor and got down. He says, because ex-Marine, this guy, he says, right. I, thought, I thought we'd caught a tripwire flare. He says, <laughs> I expected squaddies to come out. Because we're only a few miles from Filingdales, yeah, you know, and and what have you. He said, but nothing, absolutely nothing. He says the next day I got up. He says Danny went home. He says and I knew exactly where we'd seen it. He says I looked for magnesium burns, anything. He said there were nothing. But after that sphere of light, he said, Jeff's words, every, if everything foretold after that. That's what he said. He said I'd be walking around doing jobs around forest. He said, he'd got thousands of acres to maintain, so I don't know what he was doing. He said, but I could hear voices, like, near me. And he says, it was unnerving, it was strange. Me and the other one of the other gamekeepers, we could hear a baby crying. Now, that sounds Bigfoot related to some of the things that we've been talked about in the past. But regardless, Bigfoot, whatever, it's, it's, it's cryptid related. Yeah. He says, and we'd walk to where we could hear the perceived infant crying. It would stop. And it would start deeper into the forest. So there were lots of things happening after the sphere of light. And then that this particular night he's laid there and this thing comes. He says, he, he stood at the window. He says, and this guy's huge, massive man, Jeff. And he said, it, well, twice as broad as me. He says, it was just incredible. And I'm saying, he won about his head. I said, we sat there because we've done all this for wolf lands. I said, well, just, how big was this thing's head? And he went, estimate it, 15 inches. You know, what? And it was stooping down. It was it was it, it was taller than the window. And then right. we, we've, we've measured this, so we know it was over seven foot tall. And then the follow the following night, and he didn't stay after that. He what he decided to do, he said, "I was going to get the drop on it." And he didn't mean he was going to wrestle this thing, people. He, he he was he was he says I was that curious, I, and I didn't drive. He said I've got a quad bike, but if to to go back home. My parents would have to come and pick me up. He said, so I wasn't going nowhere. He said, so back in, in 2002, you'd got the farmhouse and you'd got 40-foot pines to the edge of it, sides and, and at the back, and you'd got a clearing of about 30 foot in front of right. it, the next 40-foot yeah. pines. It's all cleared now. It's all been felled. It's all clear fell. So, so I set a tarp down on the ground at, in front of it, 30, 35 foot away, under these these sort of pine branches, and I waited, and I sat there. He says, and in early hours at morning, I'm not sure what time, he says, it came out. He says, and it came out from, from the left-hand side. He says, and it went down side at farmhouse. He says, and I could, his head was above the gutter. <laughs> now, we're not talking, that, this is a barn, yeah. normal, standard height, single story, and then you've got the farmhouse. So, yeah. so let's not, you know, so we're looking at seven, seven, over seven foot tall. He says, he said, but they were all tufts of grass. This thing were abandoned. There were nothing level. There's no paths or anything. He says, but it, it, it just came down in one smooth motion. It didn't right. go up. He said, I didn't see no leg movement. It arrived. 
and then it stood looking in the window. He says, I'd packed my sleeping bag with the fire. So all that were died down again. He says, and I'm in the sleeping bag, but I'm not. He says, and it stood looking in. He says, but I knew it knew I were here. I said, don't ask me how. He says, either that or there were another one watching me. He says, so I'm, it's watching me while I'm watching it <laughs> from a distance. He said, and it just stood looking in. He said, I didn't see no ears. I didn't see no gnashing teeth. I saw no glowing eyes. I just saw this monstrous head, the huge shoulders and arms. And I don't recall seeing legs because it just arrived, which is odd. Stayed there for five to 10 minutes. And then it, it went back into the forest. He said, he waited for 20 minutes, half an hour. And then went round the back of the farmhouse. I'd have been terrified. I've got to admit, I really, I think I'd have just stayed where I was all night. Uh, you know, he, said, what? he says, going into the farmhouse was the unnerving bit because he didn't know whether there were anything inside. So he had an uneasy night. He said, and after that, he left. And, he, you know, and he's, he's, we've been back. We've, we've spent a few nights in not exact area, but in and around the area, you know, because I think to do these witnesses justice, I've got to put myself where they are. Yeah. And and uh, it, it's, it's, it's easy. You see all these documentaries, Vinny, where they'll, they'll sit in a cafe having a coffee and witnesses telling them what they saw, and then you get this reconstructed flashback of this thing. Let's get to location. I, I Seriously, I sound like a boast, but I don't think there's a documentary like Wolfland's. Certainly never been made in the, in this country. Right. Um, you know, but uh, time will tell, won't it? Absolutely. And when are we looking for the release date of, of this documentary? We, we, we've, we've, we're finished with, uh, you know, because I've been talking about, oh, we're very close, we're very close for ages, we're finished. It's gone It's gone to Mick Park now, uh, who's, who's kindly doing the music for us. And, you, you know, I mean, it's, if you look into what Mick, Mick does and has done, you'll see that his credentials. And so we're really lucky. And my daughter's an opera singer, or one of my daughters is, so she's doing the harmonies. So I don't wow. know if you first trailer and you whether you heard anything, you know. And so Jess is doing harmonies, Mix wrote the lyrics for it. So we, we've he'll just put all build up to it. I mean, it's been odd watching it because we've we've ripped all music out of it. We've had music to, as we've been doing it just to give us some kind of pace and to help Les. Yeah. You know, doing editing, but we've ripped all the music out, all the sound effects because it's gone to some professionals to have that done now. Do you know? Yeah. And I don't know, we've got, we're going to start pushing it like mad. I suppose we're pushing it now, but uh, New Year, January, you know what I mean? And uh, I've already contacted a few people to do that. And I don't know where we'll go with it, Vinny. We're, uh, we're, we're, we're hopeful that it, it'll be quite successful. That's all I can say, really. It could be a oh, I'm looking. Ah, no, I'm sure it'll be great. I'm looking forward to it, I really am. Well, and now you... Yeah, sorry, go on. Go on. No, no, please, no, carry on. on. Well, no, I, I was just going to say, you know, it's a, it's, Les has put a lot of work into it. You know, uh, we, we've had we've had arguments. I can be as awkward as anybody. I really can. <laughs> and, and so can he. But basically, for the amount of time that we've invested, we've kind of rubbed along okay. And he's put himself in them places. When we went into Broxer Forest, 800-foot ravine, this is, briefly, this is, this, is how, this is how good these witnesses were, the ones from Rotherham. The very first, I, I received the story, He'd gone looking for answers, Steve. He was looking after they'd seen it. Mm. He, he said, I couldn't close my eyes without seeing this thing. And he appeared on one of our live streams, and there were a comment came up on Truth Proof live stream. You know, I've seen something in North Forest in North Yorkshire. So I contacted him. We got talking. When he told me, he were, he broke down. He was crying. He, and I'll, he'll not mind me saying that. He were absolutely, he said, apart from Jim, I couldn't talk to anybody. He said, there's nobody I could talk to about this. He said, I just didn't know where to turn. But mm. what my point is, the very first time that they agreed to meet us, we met at a place called Reesty Bank, which means rancid, basically, uh, and which is just below Broxa Forest. And Broxa means, in some cultures, is a shapeshifter, a shapeshifting demon. So they're, they're in a forest called Broxa. So, you know, you know so, so anyway, let me get to my point. They drove straight from work an hour and three quarter drive without any food, the <laughs> metals at Reesty Bank went down into the 800 foot ravine just to show us where they'd seen it, not to do any filming, climbed back up the ravine and, and went home. So they were, uh, uh, now that's, that kind of tells you that they're not in it just to, for some kind of romancing story. But my, sure. my bigger point is, let's get just get back to Les. Les went out that night 
Les had been 65. He collapsed at top on night. We were all stood around him. He were out. He, it was that arduous. We all carried the kit up for him. We knew he weren't well. You know, he'd probably laughing or well, he might not be laughing if he's listening to this. But he's, I don't feel right well, guys. I don't feel well. So we carried it all up because it was hard work. Gets to the top, we thought, crap, thank God he's got up. We are, as you know what I mean, having to carry him up. Yeah. And he went, oh, oh, I don't feel well, and just literally just fell over, and that were it. We thought he were dead. We we wish now we'd have filmed him for a bit of drama for film. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so. We were putting water in his mouth. He was just running down side. So anyway, we we got his top clothes off, of, of top clothes, and uh, he'd overheated it. Well, he'd exhaust, exhaust. Right. So we at labouring point. Les has put feet on the ground and and got stuck in. He's not just sat behind a keyboard looking at film that we've done. He's he's had a go. Yeah. So yeah. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> dedication. And there is something to be said, I think, and I've always said this, that boots on the ground research, there's nothing like it. You can sit in front of a computer and research and look at, dig deep into documents and that, and that's great, but there's nothing better than being boots on the ground, really getting it, getting 100%. stuck in these locations. So that's fantastic. Um, before we finish up, I wanted to speak to you about, because we met at a conference and, you know, the conference scene was, you know, with the, the pandemic, that was non-existent. Um, so I'm quite new to that, but uh, you know, I get the idea that you've been doing it for some time. So I just wanted to know kind of when you first started hitting the conference scene and has it evolved since then? Well, I, I first one I did, I, and I, I get asked to do loads and I turn them down and I, I really, I really do. And it's not because of the people, the great people. Uh, I, I prefer to be sat listening to people rather or, or just milling around at a conference as it, i don't know i think it, i think it's i think there's a good bunch of people within the conference scene at the moment i've not had any kind of bad experiences or you know you get with, with, with every with that with every pastime if that's not too of corny a thing to call unexplained phenomena and people who have an interest in it there's a lot of different factions and people who disagree and you know but, but it's my way or no way kind of thing but mm. I don't I don't really come across that. I mean I bet it's there, but I've not really come across it. And uh, there's some great conferences. I really enjoyed the awakening. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, they treat us really well. You know, you know, uh, you know, con con conference organizers. And yeah. they did that mini the the mini awakening earlier in the year. And uh, then there's the other one, the mini con. The one we had recently with uh... yeah. Ash. In Manchester, yeah. Oh no, the mini con in. Uh, yes, yeah. I missed that. I I had COVID at the time, so I was meant to be on the yeah, panel. Yeah, guys, they, they throw everything at it. Really, uh, and it's well, what I what I took away from it is a really friendly atmosphere, really good. Yeah. And then then I spoke at Outer Limits conference four times now. I'm not I'm not going to speak at it this year, uh, but uh, and I've, there's a few that I've been asked to do and, and I'm not doing. I, I I think it basically, Vinny, it's time. You know. Yeah. I, I, you, you do you, when you do a talk, I'm, you stand there for an hour, and I want, to, I want I don't want to be scratching my head and thinking, oh, just wait a minute, I'll just get that bit of paper and I'll tell you. I want it to flow. Yeah, so yeah. You, and you can't do that. Everybody can talk, but when you stood in front of quite a few people, you've got to be as professional as possible, and that takes time. And I don't, and it's time that I don't want to devote every time, if I'm being truthful. Plus, I'm you're not in, for a lot of these conferences, you're not get, yeah, not getting a bean for doing it. Mm. The evening treat me really well, so I have no com no complaints at all. But a lot of them, you'll not get paid a bean, and so you're investing a lot of time for for zilch. Do you know? <laughs> and uh, although you do get a chance to sell your books, uh, but I'm not putting a negative slant on it. They're all good. I've, I've I've had some good experiences from 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 all of them really. Yeah, and that's one thing I'd say is, you know, it's a, the ones I've been to. There's an array of speakers. They might not all be your sort of cup of tea when it comes to what they're talking about, but it's those in between moments when you're networking and you're meeting people and and talking, you know, between the speak the speakers. They're just priceless because the, you know I've met so many good people that way, yourself included. So you, you know, you, you're, you're absolutely spot on, and that's why when I go to conferences, I'm, I, I find that I'm not sat listening to anybody. And it's not because they're not interesting. I, a, I've got attention span of a fly, but yeah. I, I like speaking to people. It's, yeah. it's great. It, it, it's, it's really good. And I, funny you should say that, and I'm not naming any names here. Uh, seriously, I'm not going to do that. But 
there's, there are certain people or speakers who, have, who I wouldn't be bothered if I never saw them again because of the arrogance, feeling so superior to everybody else. If anybody comes up to me at a conference, they'll get what they give me. And if, they give, if they're warm and kind, that's all, that's all they'll get back from me. Do you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. But you see other people walking about and they're too, far too important. To, to talk to people, and you, you can see people wanting to talk to them, and 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 yeah, they just want to avoid them. I don't, yeah. I don't get that. Do you know what I mean? We're all, we're all the same, aren't we? At end of day, we're all equal. And uh, seriously, I put that out there now. See me at a conference, come up and talk. I'm happy to talk. It's great. That's what it's all about. Absolutely. And, you know, thank you so much for, for being so, you know, good with your time and that when I first met you, because I'm new to the conference scene. So it was, you know, it was nerve wracking at first, you know, what, what's the etiquette? But no, you were you were totally welcome in it. And I, uh, yeah, so thank you for that. Well, listen, Paul, that's that's every, everything for tonight. Um, I'm so excited for Wolflands. I will keep my eye out. I will keep pushing, you know, the, any material that you put out, trailers and and promotional materials you know and then maybe next year when it's been out for a while we can have you back on and see how it's gone and and, and talk about it then that'd be that'd fantastic be thank you yeah appreciate that excellent thank you thank you uh, and everyone in the live chat you guys were great as awesome and uh, as always sorry um i'm gonna be back this saturday um as part of uh, crash retrieval week run by james iron at engaging the phenomena i'm going to be speaking with nicole sakach about uh, her work uh, looking into crash retrievals, the Wilson Davis memo and more. So come and join us on Saturday. For now, guys, thank you so much. Thank you again, Paul, and we'll see you soon. You. Take care.